My name is Jason Hen. I am the communications assistant for DHPSNY and want to thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Copyright 101 for Archivists and Librarians. Our presenters today are Anne Carly Zenith from the Metropolitan New York Library Council and uh, Jennifer Palmentiro from the Southeastern New York Library Resources Council. And I'm going to go ahead and hand things over now to Anne and Jen. Thanks, Jason, and thanks to Dipsney for hosting us today for Copyright 101. Hi, everyone. I am Jen Palmentiero, Digital Services Librarian at Southeastern New York Library Resources Council, and with me today is my colleague Anne Carly Zenith. Anne is currently the Associate Director of Business Development at Metro Library Council, and previously she was Metro's Digital Services Librarian. Anne and I are really excited to be joining you today for this introduction to copyright. Here's our agenda for this afternoon. First, you'll hear from Anne. She's going to provide an overview of copyright law. What is it? What does it protect? How long does it last? And what is the public domain? Then she'll highlight some limitations to copyright that are relevant to our work in libraries and archives. Then I'm going to talk about how copyright applies to some of our practices and policies in managing archival and special collections. I think we have just a little over an hour of content. Um, so we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end of the presentation, which we may or may not be able to answer because we are not lawyers. Um, and this webinar should not be considered legal advice. Please consult legal counsel when necessary. This is the obligatory slide in every presentation about copyright. Um, we are librarians. Um, Anne's work with copyright is more varied than mine. For example, she was the original project lead on the copyright review management system out of the University of Michigan. And in her previous career, before she became a librarian, she worked in the music industry where her position focused on copyright and licensing works. We both have many years of experience working closely with a variety of cultural heritage organizations on digitization projects. So we spend a lot of time considering and talking about copyright with our um, member organizations. And we talk about it a lot with each other too. So if you have any questions, uh, please type them into the chat box as you think of them, or you can save them for the end. Um, we'll be flexible. There's a, there's a logical breaking point halfway through. So if a lot of questions come in in the beginning part, we may stop and uh, have Anne address some of those, uh, or we may just save them to the end. So please just be flexible with us on that. And we will um, be distributing our slides uh, after this, and uh, Jason is recording this as well. So now I'm going to turn it over to Anne, and away we go. Okay, hi everyone. This is Anne Carly Zenith from Metro, and um, I'm going to jump in now and talk a bit about what is copyright, the origin of copyright, subject matter of copyright law in the U.S., and what it protects. And I'm going to try to speak slowly, <laughs> not too fast. So the need for copyright started to become apparent way back in the 1400s in Europe with Gutenberg's invention of the printing press and the development of movable type. This brought about an explosion in the production of new books each year. So with that came economic opportunities to sell those books. Uh, but with the ability to print also came the ability to pirate, which means people could make unauthorized copies of the books and take money out of the pockets of authors and publishers. So it became apparent pretty quickly that authors and publishers needed protections against piracy. That said, it took a few hundred years for anything to really come together. But the world's first copyright law was enacted in England in 1710, and it was called the Statute of Anne, home with any, just like me. Um, and in the United States, the first copyright law came along a little bit later in the late 1700s, after Congress was made responsible for securing the rights of authors and inventors under Article 1, Section 108 of the newly ratified U.S. Constitution. So 
this is the Copyright Act of 1790. That was our first copyright act here. The first sentence of the act is listed above, and as you can see, it gave creators of maps, charts, and books the exclusive right to print and publish copies of their works for 14 years. So that was the original term. There was a provision for an extension of the term for an additional 14 years, and we are going to talk more about copyright terms later in this presentation. It also required compliance with certain formalities which we will also define and talk about more later. Otherwise, if you did not comply with these formalities, the work was not protected. This act, actually, the t this is the first sentence here. After that first sentence, it had seven sections, and it was less than two pages long. Today, as of 1976 at least, uh, U.S. copyright law is embodied in Title 17 of the U.S. Code, and these are the chapters in the code. There are 13 chapters, plus several appendices, and several meaning many. You can download a PDF of the entire code from the copyright.gov site, and there will be a link at the end of slides for your reference. The PDF version is 2 megabytes, and it is 370 pages long. So, obviously, I'm not going to be able to cover everything in the code, but I'm going to try to get to some of the basics for you. So, first off, we're going to talk about Section 102, which is in Chapter 1, and it covers the subject matter of copyright. So, this is the sort of key sentence, and you can read it yourself, but the key pieces here for me are original works of authorship fixed in any tangible medium of expression. So let's talk first about what are original works of authorship. It is defined in the act. Original works of authorship include the following categories. So we have literary works, like books, obviously plays, etc. Um, musical works, including lyrics, dramatic works, including any accompanying music, pantomimes and choreographic works of dance, uh, artwork, so pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works, motion pictures or other AV works, sound recordings, and it also covers architectural works. Now, jumping back, let's talk about the second part, which is fixed in a tangible medium of expression. What does that mean? Well, the act actually defines it and says it must be sufficiently permanent or stable to permit it to be perceived, reproduced, or otherwise communicated for a period of more than a transitory duration. So a lot of words, but really to say it needs to be put down on paper, in a Google Doc, in some place where it's not just going to be deleted and disappear in a minute. So not transitory is the best way to define it. Uh, I also want to talk about what copyright does not cover. It does not cover facts or ideas. So it does cover, or it does protect the expression of facts and ideas. So if you wrote down the facts and expressed them in a certain way with a certain amount of originality, um, or you put your ideas down on paper, they would be protected by copyright, but the underlying facts and ideas themselves are not protected. It also does not protect systems, processes, methods of operation, procedures. It doesn't protect listings of contents or ingredients. So for example, recipes are not covered by copyright. It also does not cover names, titles, slogans, or short phrases. So moving on, we're going to talk about what is covered in Section 106 of Chapter 1, and that is the exclusive rights of the copyright holder. And I just want to sort of emphasize here that word exclusive. So this means that no one else has the rights to do any of these things unless they get permission from the copyright holder. Those rights include the right to reproduce the copyrighted work, so making copies of the work, 
to prepare derivative works based on the copyrighted work, to distribute copies of the work to the public by either sale or other transfer of ownership, or also by rental, lease, or lending, to perform the copyrighted work publicly, for instance, in the case of musical, dramatic, choreographed works, motion pictures, or any other types of AV works, to display the copyrighted work publicly in the case of pictorial, graphic, or sculptural works, including individual images from a motion picture or other AV work. And then finally, in the case of sound recordings, the right to perform the copyrighted work publicly by means of a digital audio transmission. So I mentioned earlier that that first copyright law required that the copyright holder comply with certain formalities in order to be, for works to be protected. Um, and this compliance with formalities went on in the future, and we're going to talk more about it. But I want to kind of define what that means, what formalities are. So first, it required that the copyright holder include a proper copyright notice on the work. So you had to see this notice on the work and you had to be properly uh, displayed with a, either a C in a circle or the word copyright plus the year of publication of the work and the name of the owner of the copyright in the work. So it, when it was created, you wanted to do that right away for your protection. And if you did not, the work was not protected by copyright. It automatically went into the public domain. Second, they required registration of the work. So in the United States, it was required that you register your work with the US Copyright Office. And I can remember my grandmother telling me and my grandfather he had to put, like, he was a musician, and he used to write his own original pieces of music, and he had to put the piece of his sheet music, in, a copy of it, in a sealed envelope and send it to the copyright office in order to protect his work in case someday it made a lot of money, which it never did, <laughs> um, but he did follow the formality. Um, and then third, they required that copies of the work be deposited in an officially designated repository. So in this case, in the US, this is the Library of Congress. And then finally, if the copyright holder wanted to keep the work protected for a longer period of time after the first term ended, it required that they file a renewal with the US Copyright Office to extend the term of copyright uh, for the original registration of the work. So this all, seems like a good idea in a lot of ways, right? It was better for tracking rights. It was a way to keep track of who owns what and if something had fallen into the public domain or not. However, the requirements to comply with these formalities in order to maintain copyright have been largely phased out over time. So today, Copyright is automatic upon fixation of an original work in a tangible medium of expression. So if you create something after you get off of this webinar and you jot it down on paper, you create a Google Doc or whatever, it's copyrighted right away because you've just fixed it in a tangible medium of expression. And that's all you have to do. And now it is protected for the term of copyright. No, there's no need anymore for notice or registration. There's no more renewals. There's no more deposit requirement. However, it is still advisable to include a copyright notice or, if applicable, a Creative Commons license on published works in order to inform the public that the work is protected and identify the copyright owner and provide the year that the work was um, published so that a potential licensor has some information about who to contact and by being able to see the year, they can figure out how long the work is going to be protected and when it's going to fall into the public domain. Um, copyright registration is actually still required for a copyright holder to collect statutory damages for copyright infringement. So say my grandpa's works were making money on a regular basis he would definitely want to still be registering his copyright with the Copyright Office in case anyone ever used his works without permission and he wanted to sue them for infringement. 
he could collect the full amount of damages permittable under statutory law in the U.S. if it was registered. If not, he doesn't get the full protection of the law. So now I'm going to move forward and talk a little bit about the duration of copyright and get into the public domain. So just keep in mind that the determination of whether a copyright has expired depends on an examination of the copyright in its source country. Um, since this is complicated enough, <laughs> we're going to focus on copyright terms in the United States. And this means we're talking primarily about works that are first created and are published in the United States. So the length of copyright in the U.S. today is limited dish in duration. Uh, the current term in the U.S. is life of the author plus 70 years. So remember, if you create a work today and you fix it in a tangible medium of expression, it is protected until 70 years after you die. For anonymous and corporate works, the term is 95 years after publication or 120 years after. 120 years after creation date. The term of copyright has obviously changed over time. So that original act, remember, the term was 14 years with the right to renew for one additional 14 year term if the copyright holder was still alive. That was under the original act. Then in 1831, there was a, re a revision to the Copyright Act and it was extended to 28 years with a possible 14 year extension. Then uh, the Copyright Act of 1909 extended it further, where the original term was still 28 years, but now you had a possible 28-year extension. And at this point, it was no longer limited to uh, authors who were still alive because they were probably not alive anymore. <laughs> um, so it was just the copyright holders had the right to renew. Then the 1976 Act was the big change where copyright term became based on the life of the author plus X number of years. And the reason that this came about is because um, the U.S. wanted to get in line, get it, our law in line with laws throughout the rest of the world because it was going to be easier to enforce copyright if our terms matched up. So in 1976, it changed to life of the author plus 50 years. And then in 1998, uh, Congress passed the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, which is sometimes known as the Mickey Mouse Protection Act, because it effectively froze the release of <clears throat> works in the public domain for another 20 years and theoretically was um, driven a lot by Disney and other big copyright holders who wanted to protect their works for a longer period of time. And also should be um, clarified that a lot of the other countries in the around the world also had this term of life of the author plus 70, although not all of them. Some are still like Canada is 50, I believe it's still 50, and Mexico I think is life of the author plus 100. So now I'm going to talk about the public domain. Works are in the public domain if the copyright in the work has expired, like we just talked about. Also, it could be in the public domain if the rights holder failed to comply with those copyright formalities. So the formalities pretty much applied in some form up until 1989. You had to renew a copyright up until 1963, and you had to include a copyright notice, I believe it was up to 1989. So, but after 89, you didn't have to anymore. But if you didn't, and the work was created during that period, between 23 and 89, a work could have fallen into the public domain. Also, works may not be eligible for copyright protection. So, for example, uh, U.S. government works that are created by government employees in the course of their work uh, are not eligible for copyright protection. And finally, a rights holder also could dedicate their work to the public domain. Um, so, like Creative Commons has a mechanism where if you create some amazing resource today and you want to immediately dedicate it to the public domain so everyone can use it and reuse it and make copies and make derivative works and do all sorts of things with it, 
Um, you could put a Creative Commons CC0 license, it's called. Uh, you could do that and dedicate the work to the public domain, and then everyone doesn't have to wait until seven years after your death to benefit and use your work. Um, moving forward. Oh, one more thing I wanted to mention on this one. So works in the public domain, um, with certain ex exceptions, means that anyone without permission fees or any, anything can now reproduce the work, prepare derivative works, distribute copies, et cetera, et cetera. So all that stuff we talk about in section 106. If a work is in the public domain, uh, anyone can use the work without getting permission from the copyright holder to do all that stuff. Uh, but I want to just go over a few caveats and things you need to watch out for with the public domain. So works that fall into the public domain could still have other protections. So they could be protected by trademark law, or there could be privacy or publicity rights involved. They could be covered by trade secret law or contract laws, among others. In addition, Newer versions or adaptations of these derivative works, like translations of works or annotations and illustrated editions of work, they may be protected by a separate copyright. So copyright and later versions or adaptations of new things, um, that's a fresh layer of creative material added on by a new creator and they may still be protected. And then finally, just Reminder, works in the public domain in the U.S. may still be protected in other countries. And we won't go into it too much, but just be aware of that. So next, I want to tell you about this wonderful resource. I hope that many, most of you know about it already, but if you don't, you need to know about it because it's awesome. Um, this was a chart created by Peter Hurdle, who is a... He worked at Cornell University Library for a long time. I think he's now, he, I know he works for the Berkman Center, um, but I think he's still a senior policy advisor to Cornell. I don't know, there might be some Cornell people out there who could confirm. But anyway, the site is maintained by Cornell University still, and it is updated on January 1st every year, and it is so amazing um, because it helps you like it sort of breaks down how to determine if a work is like what the copyright status is and if it's in the public domain. It um, has information on publication status and restored foreign copyrights and all these special cases. It has more information than you could ever ever need, <laughs> but it is like the go-to resource for deter determining copyright status of works in the U.S. So. You must bookmark it if you haven't already, and remember this is where you need to start whenever you need to determine copyright status. So now I'm going to talk um, a little bit about copyright limitations on those exclusive rights of copyright holders. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so remember, we talked about Section 106, those exclusive rights of copyright owners. The next several sections in the code uh, sections 107 through 111 cover limitations on those exclusive rights. So we are going to talk about two of those exceptions today that are most relevant to librarians and archivists. And that those are section 107, which covers fair use, and section 108, which covers reproduction for libraries and archives. Now just keep in mind, both of these are kind of tricky. Section 107, there's a lot of caveats and it's very open to interpretation. And Section 108 is kind of limited and outdated in a way. Um, but I'm going to try to give you the main points. I'm not going to get too much into the nuances of these. So basically, Section 107 says that it is not an infringement to use copyright works for certain purposes and under certain conditions. The purposes are criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, including making multiple copies for classroom use only, scholarship, and research. The conditions are known as the four factors. 
And here's where we get into the trickier part. The four factors look simple <laughs> when you look at them on the slide, but they are widely open to interpretation. And you have to look at all of them in order to make a determination about whether or not something is fair use. And some of them weigh more heavily than others. And there is no official formula. So more and more lately, disputes about the meaning of fair use and what it, you know, is something of fair use or not have arisen where the case has had to go to the courts to be decided. And this is actually a really good thing because every time something goes to court, there's more and more definition around what is really fair use and what isn't. So it provides people like us with more guidance about how to apply fair use. And there have been a lot of cases over the last, I would say, probably 10 to 15 years that have been pretty important and good news for libraries and archives. So um, if you are curious and have extra time, uh, you might want to look into that a little bit more. So a couple of fair use resources I just want to mention to you if you are interested in learning more. Uh, one is Stanford Univer University Library site. Um, they have this great fair use site. I, this slide here shows the page on four factors. There's also like a general overview and then they also have summaries of fair use cases and a section on um, disagreements over fair use and when you are likely to get sued. <laughs> so it's a great site. I would definitely recommend you take a look. It's not like it doesn't have too much information. So it's a nice um, like kind of introduction and overview and a good go-to resource. And then this other tool, this, I don't I haven't used this one too much, but I know that other people do. It's a fair use evaluator. It's from the American Library Association. And uh, there's URLs for all of these at the end of the presentation. So moving on, I want to talk about one other set of exceptions, and that, that is section 108, which are exceptions for libraries and archives. So section 108 provides exceptions to the exclusive rights of copyright holders specifically for libraries, archives, and reviewers. So it actually applies to many of you joining us today, and it provides you with the ability to make reproductions of some types of copyrighted works without the permission of the copyright holder. Section 108 provisions cover the right to make copies in a, of works in a library archive for purposes of research and scholarship, uh, also to make preservation and replacement copies, and to make copies of works that are no longer being exploited commercially in their last 20 years of copyright. The downside of Section 108 is that it only applies to textual works, so musical works, pictorial works, graphics, sculptural, motion pictures, and any other AV works are not on the table for Section 108. Um, and the other thing to remember, it's important about like which libraries and archives qualify for this, only libraries and archives that are open to the public and or that provide service to unaffiliated researchers qualify to take advantage of this. So if you if, it, if your library is private and only serves like the audience that is like belongs to your library or archive, um, then you wouldn't qualify for Section 108, I think. Most places serve the public and, and outside researchers, but I think maybe not all of you on this call. Um, so I'm going to try to take you through this. Um, so first of all, Section 108 covers the ability to make copies of entire works if a new or used copy of that work is not available for purchase at a reasonable price. It also allows you to make copies of periodical articles um, or um, contributions to uh, compilation work. Um, there are conditions around these two uh, privileges. So one is that the copy becomes the property of the user who requested it or the library archive who requested it. Um, there is an expectation that it will only be used for research, scholarship, and private study. It will not be used for commercial purposes. A warning of copyright must be placed uh, or displayed actually where orders for such um, copies are accepted. So in the old days, in the 
library. You know, we had signs up like around the copy machines and stuff where I guess where people um, placed ILO orders and things like that. And then also the copy must include a notice of copyright or if uh, you don't have the information about the copyright handy, then some kind of statement that the work may be protected. Then the other provisions about replacement and preservation, and these are kind of good ones. Um, you can make up to three copies of works that are damaged, deteriorating, lost, or stolen if an unused replacement copy cannot be obtained at a fair price. And now that we can, you know, go online and look and see that, you know, can I find anything on Amazon that's not like a million dollars? If I can't, then, and my, my copy in my library is falling apart, and it's a text work, then I'm allowed to make copies of it. Um, and then as far as preservation, you can make up to three copies of <clears throat> unpublished works for preservation or security, as long as you already have a copy of that work in your collection. So the conditions on this, obviously, a lot of the copies today are going to be digital um, for the most part. Those copies can't be made available to the public except on library premises. So um, just going back to my uh, days at Michigan with the whole copyright review management system thing, I remember we were doing reviews of works that were we knew were damaged, deteriorating in our collection, and. Um, when we could confirm that you couldn't find an unused replacement copy, we were digitizing a lot of stuff. We would digitize, put it online, but then we IP protected it. So only people who were trying to access the work from IP addresses like on campus were able to see it. So it's kind of a bummer, but at least you can make it available to some extent. And again, the whole like need to have a copyright notice and not commercial purposes only. And then I just wanted to get mention this um, other provision that I feel like a lot of people don't really know about, but works that are published, but they are in the last 20 years of their copyright term. Um, so I guess works that are going to fall into the public domain, like they're protected still, but they are going to fall in the public domain between like 2019 and 2038, I guess, or seven. I don't know. I'm getting my four years mixed up. Anyway, you get the idea. They can be reproduced, distributed, displayed, or performed um, on the, like a library archive can authorize this if the work is not currently subject to commercial exploitation and again a copy cannot be obtained at a fair price. So and uh, commercial purposes must include copyright notice. So it's kind of like a little known thing but it's sort of like a there's some good stuff you can maybe take advantage of there. Uh, and finally, before I wrap up my part, I just want to mention that, as you may have noticed, <laughs> Section 108 is pretty limited, and I keep saying this, but it seems kind of outdated. Um, the Copyright Office has been looking at Section 108 again recently, and I say again because there was an earlier effort in the 2000s, I think, uh, to examine Section 108 and talk about how it might be changed, but then nothing ever, it never went anywhere in that first round. But they've been talking again in 2016 and 2017 about how the section might be updated to include more types of works, so not just text, and then also clarify how things work now in a world where we can make copies so easily that you don't have to have a giant copy machine at the library to make copies. So I'm not sure what will happen with this round of inquiry, but there was a report that was released in September of 2017 that I, I just glanced through it kind of quickly, but the topics of discussion in their report seemed really promising to me. Uh, and then just the last thing is another resource to recommend related to Section 108. This is another um, spinner from ALA, and it's really pretty cool. There's, you can use it online as well. And you can like move the arrow around and it has a little window that kind of gives you like the gist of the provisions for each of these, you know, preservation, replacement, etc. And then um, you can click on click for details and then it gives you more information and those all those conditions and it's all in one place. So um, I like it. It's a pretty good resource for section 108. And that's it. I see there are no questions so far. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to Jen and she's going to um, jump in now with deeds of gift and donor agreements. 
Thanks, Anne. Um, actually, we did have one question come in uh, directly to us um, uh, about copyright, public domain, and state uh, works. Um, I don't know if you can answer that, if you want to wait until the end and answer that. Um, what would you prefer? It's, uh, it's under our presenter tab. It wasn't sent to everybody, but it's a good question. Uh, my understanding is it varies by state, but I don't know that I'm as well positioned to answer that. So um, I could keep going, Anne, and you can answer it at the end if you want to do that. Yeah, because I don't know how to access the question. Oh, I see. Presenter said, what about works created by state employees? No. Um, <clears throat> the answer to that is it's not, those works are not necessarily in the public domain. I don't know, I don't know off the top of my head of any states where anything is public domain. Maybe there is a state, but I know in Michigan and New York it's not the case <laughs> for sure. So um, it's not state. State documents are not necessarily automatically in the public domain. Hopefully that answers the question. Thanks. All right. So thanks again, Anne, for that great overview of copyright law. Um, copyright has such a huge impact on our professional work, obviously, um, so much so that Congress wrote some library and archive exemptions right into the law, as Anne just explained. Um, now we're going to transition and talk a little bit about um, copyright in practice um, in our work with unique archival special and local history collections. We're going to start at the beginning of the collection management cycle and talk about copyright in our deeds of gift or donor agreements. Um, the Society of American Archivists has a wonderful guide to deed of, deeds of gift written to educate potential donors. Um, it covers all the elements you would find in a deed of gift. Um, I'm going to focus on the intellectual property section of these agreements, but a link to the full um, guide from the Society of American Archivists is on our resource list at the end. Um, so just before we get started, it's important to note that physical ownership of a work is separate from copyright ownership. Um, copyright must be transferred in writing. Um, so I know some older deeds of gift uh, or donor records did not explicitly address copyright. Uh, and of course, some collections come to us without any documentation at all. I know sometimes you show up and there's just things on your doorstep. It does happen. Um, so your repository likely has many items to which you own the physical um, property, but the intellectual property is owned by someone else. So, and in preparation for this webinar, I looked at a bunch of deeds of gift from different, all different types and sizes of organizations. It had been a while since I had done that. Um, and I was curious if, I, if I'd find any without an intellectual property section. Um, when I first started working on digitization projects, which was you know, 14 years ago, um, at least now, maybe 15, wow. Uh, it was not unheard of for deeds of gift to not address uh, copyright. Um, so I'm happy to say I couldn't find one out there on the web that didn't address it in some way. Um, there were lots of different flavors, though, in terms of what kind and how much information they asked for. Um, the more information you can get about copyright in your deed of gift, the better. Um, so in an ideal world, uh, gift agreements should include some form of a copyright declaration from the donor. Um, it can be in the form of a checkbox or some other way, but just having them say, yes, I own the copyright to some or all of the materials in the collection. Uh, no, I don't, but perhaps I know who does, and here they are, um, some contact information for them, um, or if they don't know. Um, if they own rights to some of the materials, but not all, it would be, again, in an ideal world, uh, wonderful if they could identify which ones they own. Um, obviously, they can't transfer rights to materials where the copyright is owned by someone else. Um, their collections may contain letters written to them, uh, and the copyright would be uh, held by the letter writer. Um, photographs taken by other people, publications, ephemera, clippings, artwork, uh, other things they've collected over time. Um, all the kinds of wonderful things you, you work with. Um, so even with an awesome deed of gift, you will definitely acquire materials with third party rights. And beyond a declaration of rights, there should be language specifying the transfer or not of intellectual property rights. Um, again, because physical ownership doesn't automatically e uh, equal intellectual property ownership. It makes your job a lot easier if donors agree to transfer whatever rights they have in the materials to your organization, or better yet, if they are willing to relinquish their rights and transfer the materials to the public domain. Um, but that is certainly not always possible, and they can be given the choice to retain all or some of their rights. 
Um, if they want to retain their copyrights, the agreement should stipulate any allowances that they are willing to provide the repository. For example, will they give your organization permission to publish or exhibit or digitize? Um, if they want to retain their rights, perhaps you can encourage them to assign a license that dictates third-party use, um, especially if uh, they have authored you to digitize. Uh, once items go online, you will get requests for reproductions and people will want to use them in all kinds of ways. Um, if you can address end user permissions ahead of time with your donors, that will save everyone, um, you, the donor, the, and your end users time and energy in the long run. If they transfer copyrights, they may do so with some restrictions. Uh, they may want to retain copyright in some of their works uh, for a period of time, but maybe not all or they may want access or use uh, restrictions based on privacy concerns or because of health information or other sensitive information in the collection. Um, these reasons go beyond copyrights, but any and all restrictions should be in the agreement. And your aim is for any restrictions to be for the shortest time possible. Um, if they want to retain their rights or otherwise restrict access or use, to some or all of the works, you should agree to an end date. Remember that copyright lasts for 70 years after death. That's a long time. Um, so perhaps you can no negotiate for them to keep their rights for their lifetime and then the rights get transferred to your organization or relinquished altogether um, once they pass on. It might be a good idea to include some language from Section 108 in your agreement um, that communicates to the donor your rights to make copies for preservation, security, replacement, and for patrons' private study and research. Um, not all donors are aware of that, so you know, even though you have that right within the law, just putting it in your agreement um, just puts it right out there that you do have rights to, to, to perform some of those activities. Um, I've also seen some uh, donor agreements that include some language about fair use as well, letting them know that their works can be used for criticism, classroom use, um, all those things that Anne mentioned when she talked about fair use. Um, if you are taking in born digital materials, which happens more and more now in libraries and archives, uh, you might want to consider including some language that gives you permission to duplicate and reformat those um, digital files as necessary to preserve that content over time. So we have briefly covered uh, copyrights and acquisitions, kind of one end of the information life cycle. And now let's move to, you know, towards the other end of the information life cycle and talk a little about use and reuse of collection materials. Let's start with your organizations. Um, use and reuse of materials in your collections. As Anne mentioned, Section 108 grants libraries and archives the right to make copies of certain works for preservation, replacement, and private study purposes as long as certain conditions are met. What if your organization wants to do something beyond what Section 108 and fair use might allow? Um, like digitize, publish, or ex exhibit. And it doesn't necessarily mean that those things um, go beyond you know, fair use, but, but they may. So if you're concerned that your use is not covered under Section 108 or 107, um, you would want to um, get, uh, go through the process of first determining copyright status um, before you use it. And you can do this in a number of ways. So you want to look at your deeds of gift and donor agreements, if they exist, to see if and what rights got transferred to your organization or what allowances the rights holder may have given you. Um, if you don't have a deed of gift or if it doesn't address uh, copyright, check the materials themselves. Look for any information that can help you make a good copyright determination. Um, so you're looking for dates, maybe publication dates or creation dates or creator death dates. Um, inspect published items for copyright notices or lack thereof. And refer to Peter Hurdle's chart that Anne um, referenced earlier and again linked um, from our resources slide. Uh, if you look at Peter Hurdle's chart while inspecting the information available to you, uh, you might be able to make uh, a copyright determination that way. Obviously, if you are the copyright holder, you can do whatever you want with that item. Um, if you've determined the item is in the public domain, you can also do whatever you want. You don't need uh, permission. Um, per, you know, permission to grant use isn't owned by anybody at that point, so you can just do whatever you want. If you can't determine the copyright status and you don't know whom to ask, assess the risk of using the materials. 
I'm not going to provide any advice here about uh, risk management. Some organizations are more risk adverse than others. Some materials have more risk than others. Um, risk assessment is really handled on a case-by-case -case basis and may be best referred to legal counsel. If you know the resources in copyright and you can identify the copyright holder or think you can, um, then you should seek permission to use the material, again, if you believe your intended use goes beyond fair use in section 108. Um, so here are some tips for seeking permissions. Um, phone calls might be the best way to start locating and communicating with rights holders. Uh, it's certainly, you know, one of the easiest ways to, you know, to, to talk to people. Um, but you'll want to get permission in writing and you'll want as much information documented about the conversation as possible. So after reaching a rights holder, you might want to continue the discussion via email or, you know, regular mail if, if a donor doesn't, you know, have email. So uh, when communicating with rights holders, clearly identify yourself and your organization and provide contact information. Um, if they are not the content creator, tell them why you think they are the rights holder. Perhaps they are an heir. Sometimes heirs don't even realize that, that, that they have the rights to, to materials. Um, clearly identify the works you want to use. Give them as much information as you have. Titles, editions, creators, any dates you know about. Um, clearly state how you will use their works and whether and how they will be distributed. And consider all uses beyond maybe that immediate use you're thinking of. Um, for example, if you want, are going to use it in one way, but maybe want to do some promotion around it and want to use the materials in, in, in promotions, um, then you might want to include that. Uh, if you plan to profit from the work, you should probably let them know that. Um, you might have better luck if you aren't asking for exclusive rights, meaning you aren't asking them to transfer um, their copyright to you. They can still retain their rights, and you're just asking if you can use them and, uh, as well. Um, ask them how they want to be credited. Provide a permission form. Um, if you're sending through the regular mail, provide a second copy for their records and include a self-addressed stamped envelope. You want to make it as easy as possible for them to say yes. You want to document all correspondence and record every attempt to reach a rights holder. It may take a while to hear back from them. Um, they may never respond um, and they may say no, so that does happen. Um, if you are requesting to digitize their materials and make them publicly accessible online and they grant you permission for that, ask if they are willing to assign a license for third party use. Again, as I mentioned, once things go up online, um, people obviously know about it more easily and they'll come to you and they'll want to, to use it as well. So again, while you're working with the rights holder to get the permissions you need, see what kinds of rights they'll grant to third party use. If, if the works are going to be made so easily accessible. So I want to talk a little bit more about digitization and copyright. Um, if you are digitizing and you've gone through the process of determining copyright status and getting permissions when needed, you have options for conveying copyright and reuse status to users in a consistent and standardized way. Um, and the two methods for doing this are Creative Commons, which Anne mentioned um, earlier, and a newish standard called Right Statements. And again, these are both um, on your resources slide at the end of the presentation. Creative Commons offers a simple and standardized mechanism for content creators to license their works. There are liberal licenses that allow for commercial uses uh, or really creative reuses under certain circumstances and conditions, and there are more conservative licenses. Creative Commons is a web-based uh, system, which means that each license has a web page that explains that license in detail. So you can link directly um, from items in your digital repository to the appropriate license, um, making it really easy for the public to know if and how they can use copyrighted works. If you are the copyright holder, or if you have worked with a copyright holder, um, you can, you know, communicate out with, with, with your users um, how they can use these resources. And then they don't have to come to you every time. Um, they just know what they can do. Um, 
Creative Commons does include a public domain mark um, and mentioned the CC0 license, which is for um, content creators who want to release their works into the public domain. That's what the CC0 license is for. Um, but uh, Creative Commons does include just a straight public domain mark. So if you're working with materials that are super old that you know are just in the public domain everywhere, um, you can just go ahead and assign a public domain mark to it. And then everybody knows that they can use it freely. Now, another option beyond the licensing uh, is called write statements, and it's a fairly newish standard. Um, write statements are not licenses, okay? They are statements, and they are intended to be applied by cultural heritage organizations to convey what they know about the copyright status of a work to users of their digital collections. Um, there are 12 standardized statements. Um, a couple of them aren't intended to be used in the US. Uh, so I think in the US we have about 10 to work with. Um, they are divided into three general categories. There are some for in copyright resources, some for out of copyright resources, and that you know other category. Because when you're talking about copyright, there's always the other category. Um, if you, for example, if you don't know the copyright status, there is a statement for that. Um, if you know a work is in copyright, but the copyright holder is unlocatable or unidentifiable, there is a statement for that. Um, just like Creative Commons, this standard is web-based. Each of the um, standard rights statements has its own web page. So again, you can link directly from uh, item level in your digital repository to one of these standard statements. Um, and together, these two systems, and I say together, you don't you wouldn't assign both a Creative Commons license and a right statement to the same work, but um, together these two systems offer a comprehensive and standardized way to convey copyright or reuse information to users. If you are not familiar with them, I encourage you to check them out, especially if you are um, already digitizing or are considering digitizing uh, collections for online access. So what about end users' rights? It's really not any different than how the law applies to your organization's use. Fair use applies to everyone. And just like you, if a patron's intended use goes beyond fair use or the applicable allowances provided in Section 108, it is their responsibility to seek permission from the copyright holder. And they would want to do all those same things that we just went through um, in terms of seeking permissions. For items in the public domain, once they get a hold of a copy, they are free to use and reuse it for any and all purposes without permission. The intellectual property belongs to them as much as it belongs to anyone else. Now you or your donors can deny access, um, restrict access, or uh, restrict reproduction services. If an item's really fragile, maybe it can't be uh, reproduced. Um, and you can do that for any materials in your collection for any reason. Um, but once someone gets a hold of a copy of a public domain work, they are free to do whatever they want with it without seeking permission. So let's talk a little bit more about um, our patrons' use by taking a dip into uh, fees and permission policies. It has been a fairly common practice for repositories to require that users ask their permission to use any item from their collections, regardless of copyright status and copyright ownership. It's also not uncommon for organizations to charge a range of fees based on the intended use of a work. They might charge one fee for personal use versus public distribution. There's nonprofit fees versus um, for-profit fees, you know, commercial, film, television. Um, you tend to see fees increase for uh, higher uh, print runs of a publication. You know, kind of the more eyeballs that are going to see it, the more uh, you're going to charge for it. But there's been a national conversation happening around fee schedules and permission policies for at least the last 15 years. Um, and that has led to a shift in our thinking and practice. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, the shift has an ethical element to it, but also a legal element. Our fee and permission policies um, kind of out there in the field have been reevaluated through the lens of copyright law. Um, I want to focus this discussion less on the ethical side and more on the legal side of the conversation, since it's the law that brought us together today. So let's just review the exclusive rights of copyright holders that Anne shared with us earlier. I'm not going to uh, go through them like she did. But uh, as she mentioned, as Anne mentioned, uh, copyright holders and copyright holders alone have 
have these rights um, to exploit their works or to authorize others to do so. So now let's apply uh, these exclusive rights to the general copyright categories of our collections. And again, this is general. This is kind of a broad overview and talk about um, permissions. When your organization owns the copyright, you are within your rights to grant or deny permission for any use beyond fair use and what Section 108 allows. If your organization is not the copyright holder, the right to grant permission doesn't inherently belong to you. Uh, Section 108 allows you to make a copy of a resource for a patron as long as you have no knowledge that that resource will be used for anything other than private study. So should you really be in the practice of granting permission to use copyrighted material? You could put your organization at risk by doing so. That said, copyright holders could have granted you permission to grant or deny uh, further permissions to third parties. So check your deed of gift and see if you are allowed um, to grant or deny permission for use. If you aren't, then the user needs to secure permission from the copyright holder. If you are able to share information with them about copyright holders, great. But you don't need to research copyright status or copyright owners for them or seek permission for them. That is their responsibility. So what about public domain resources? You own the physical object and can control access to it for any reason, such as security, privacy, condition, donor uh, agreements, for example. But if there aren't any other protections or restrictions in place, should you require permission to use a public domain work from your collection? Under copyright law, users don't have to get permission to use a public domain work. Public domain means the item belongs to the public. If your current practice is to require permission to use public domain works, um, Anne and I would strongly encourage you to reconsider that policy. Um, at the very least, uh, consider not limiting uh, them to a one-time use of a public domain work. Maybe start there um, while you work with your stakeholders to kind of reevaluate. Um, some things to consider around this is, or do you have the resources to inform, uh, enforce these uh, user agreements? Um, it's important to note that if a copy of a public domain work ends up in another party's hands, that user number two is not bound by the agreement you made with user number one. Because it's in the public domain, they can use it freely for any purpose. The shift in practice I mentioned a few minutes ago is towards being less restrictive in our permission policies. Repositories are moving away from granting or denying permission for items in the public domain and for items in which they do not hold the copyright. Some are even moving away from requiring permissions to use items in which they do hold the copyright. As I mentioned, this trend is largely rooted in copyright law, but there are also ethical and practical elements to this. We generally want our, to increase access to and use of our collections, so our policies are changing to better reflect that part of our mission. On the practical side, it's time consuming to negotiate user agreements, it's difficult to enforce them, and it can frustrate our users. So just some things to keep in mind. Similarly, we've seen a shift in fee policies and fee schedules over the years. Repositories that have evaluated their policies through the lens of copyright law have stopped charging use fees, which used to be really, really common, and it still is pretty common. But now these organizations, um, they're still charging reproduction fees and service fees, but they are not adding an additional use fee on top of that. Um, it's perfectly reasonable to charge for your reproduction services. But charging for different uses when you aren't the copyright holder may put your organization at risk. When your organization owns the copyright, you are within your rights to charge whatever you want. You can charge for different uses. Um, some repositories do this, and what they do is they have two different fee schedules, one for items in which they own the copyright and one for items where they don't. Others have flattened their fee schedule, and they charge the same reproduction fee for all materials regardless of copyright status. Um, what's really common now, instead of charging for different uses, is you're charging for different formats. Um, so, you know, fees range from pennies, uh, you know, nothing to pennies for photocopies, and then it kind of moves up from there. So if you want a photo print, it's one price. If you want a low res resolution digital image, it's one price. If you want a high resolution digital image, it's um, maybe a higher price. Um, some have reduced fees if the item's already been digitized versus if they have to create a new scan for you. 
Um, lots of organizations now, well, I don't know about lots, <laughs> but some um, that make their collections available online are offering free downloads um, right from their digital collections. So you don't need to ask any permission. You don't need to pay anything. It's there. We can provide you with a download link and off you go. So some do charge, again, not for different uses, but for different users. I uh, have seen a lot of fee schedules that charge um, very little you know, to nothing or nothing up to a certain number of copies for their immediate community that they serve and then maybe charge outside researchers a little more. A lot of these um, reproduction policies and fee schedules state that the fees do not imply permission for use from the repository and that the patron is responsible for securing copyright for uses that go beyond fair use. That's a really good idea to, to put into your fee policies um, if you haven't already, uh, just so that they don't think that, that them paying you something implies that they're getting permission to use something that might be copyrighted by somebody else. Um, another thing to, you might want to include on your fee policy and schedule is, uh, you know, some language about how these fees help you um, help them more. You know, these fees help us care for th these materials and make more uh, resources available to you. Um, so letting them know what, 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 how that helps you is, is, is a good idea. Okay. So just to recap about all of this, Section 108 allows libraries and archives to make copies for researchers as long as there is no direct or indirect commercial advantage and as long as there is no knowledge that the resource will be used for anything other than private study. So this shift I've been talking about, you know, this trend in kind of being more open, being less restrictive, um, flattening our, our fee schedules to be more about formats than uses, is just all getting us more in line with um, the spirit of copyright law. So that is um, the end of our content. Here is our resources slide. And again, our slides will be made available to you. So these are all of the uh, resources that Ann and I mentioned today. And just one more time, <laughs> we are not lawyers, um, but we will try to answer some questions. And I see a lot of text over in the, um, in the chat panel there. So I'm going to review that. Uh, Anne, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself, if there's anything you'd like to say right now. Yeah, I'm unmuted. Um, yeah, I've been kind of keeping an eye on the questions. There's, there seems to be more people chiming in. Um, do you want to just like scroll back up, Jen, to the first one, like the top? It's right under me. I just put in a correction because I just double checked because <laughs> um, I said Canada, it was life, life of the author plus 50. Uh, until 2015, and then they extended it. So the copyright term in Canada is life of the author plus 70, just like in the US. Um, the first question I see there's from Amy Sanderson, and Jen, I was working with this one, and would help me. <laughs> um, the first part of your question, if, they, if, if you create something that is, um, you know, a copyrighted work, basically, and it's produced as part of your employ. It's like something you're creating as in the course of your job, and you are like a, a full-time employee at an organization. Yeah, that work becomes a work for hire, and your organization technically owns it, unless you have some other kind of special provisions. That's my understanding of how that works. Your question about the institution's board members, I was like, oh no, I'm not sure about that one. I can't say. Absolutely, like my sense is that the board member, and Lefty's like, he, she, I shouldn't say he, she or she, um, or they signed something saying that these, like any kind of papers that they created in the course of their service as a board member um, become the property of the organization. I can't, I don't think you should automatically assume that. Um, because they're not employees. So I think the, the answer is that it depends and you'd have to try to investigate if there were, was any other type of assignment of rights. And if there wasn't, then you might want to just try to get that. Um, does that sound right, Jennifer? I agree. <laughs> okay, and then the next one, I also am going to ask you, John, to chime in on this one because I... It's from Dina Schlimmer, and she's asking if, it sounds like the question is, 
how reliable are the um, ARL code, code of best practices for fair use in academic libraries that was um, issued in 2012, and how much can, can libraries and archives rely on what's in those? And I would say, I am not sure how, I can't say for sure, like, I don't think there are any court cases that um, have come about, I'm not aware of any court cases where anything in those <laughs> guidelines has been tested specifically, um, I don't think. But when you're talking about putting archival collections online, I mean, there there is a provision in those um, in those guidelines about digitizing uh, special collections and making them available. But there are a lot of caveats and it, there's a lot of advice around how to be safer and make that qualify more as a fair use. So I would say, you know, as long as you're, I would just be careful about trying to follow the best practices that they provide in those guidelines to make sure that you're being as safe as possible. And one of them I think is if those works are still potentially in copyright, you might want to you know, put protections on there so that people can't download them and use them further. Do you have anything else to add to that, Jen? Uh, just that, uh, you know, in the work that I do um, with dozens of cultural heritage organizations to digitize collections. Yes, yeah, seeking permission is um, prohibitive. Uh, you know, and oftentimes we just we just don't know. We don't even know who to ask. Um, so have has anyone referenced this best practice, practice document to me in their decision making for putting something up? Um, no, uh, but it's, a, you know, at that point it's about managing your risk and they certainly do put up things where they're not sure of copyright status or who the copyright owner may be, um, and they just kind of weigh that risk, and uh, and nothing's happened, um, as you know, in 15 and years think, of doing this. I, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say I just think it's really important that you understand what fair use is if you're going to put make stuff available under the premise of, that it's a fair use make sure you understand what fair use is and understand those guidelines and even like the best thing would be to document how you investigated or analyzed it even if it's just briefly so that's just protecting yourself um i wouldn't just automatically be like oh it's you know i think pretty sure it's in there so it's okay to just put up a whole collection no matter what i would definitely just be aware of how it applies and make sure that you feel like you are doing it within the guidelines. Right. And I think the two big uh, things we can lean on are the, the educational nonprofit uh, use we're making and putting them out there and also that commercial, you know, impact part of, of it that, um, you know, these, these things came to you somehow because nobody else wanted to do anything with them anymore. Um, so is you know they you're not really exploiting anyone else's um at, at that point their ability to to make money off of it because chances are there's heirs out there who don't even know that that's it was their ancestors who who owned this stuff um so yeah no understanding the tenets of fair use and being able to make a good case for it you know i've had i've had had some um organizations that they're dealing with artworks and they can't um find copyright holders they've put up small thumbnails because um, I do think there has been some some case law that has said thumbnails are, are fair use, even online. Um, so they've gone that route. So I think it's, you know, like Anne said, being safe, being smart, knowing, um, you know, thinking thinking provide, about it. So. And provide a mechanism for people to tell, easy mechanism for people to tell you, you know, if you know you're putting in copyright stuff up online, add some way for people to get in touch with you and say, if you know, you know, if you, know who the copyright owner is or you have any you know, disputes make it easy for people to get in touch with you and let you know um, just having that mechanism available also provides additional kind of defense and protection against you know being accused of anything uh, so um, I guess moving on to the yeah, the next question right 
Catherine Collette. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, John, you can take this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, if you're, ta yeah, uh, yes, obviously we, we would want them to, a lot. <laughs> yeah, a lot. So, um, it, it, technically they don't have to credit you or cite you, um, under the, you know, the public domain, um, under the public domain, they don't have to do that, but we would obviously want them to do that. So uh, it's an ask, you're not demanding that they do it, but you should absolutely ask if, if they would do that, um, which is. Yeah, awesome. And we put that right out there, you know, in our digital repositories. Even if something's in the public domain, we say please credit such and such library um, if you use this item. So there's no, there's, you can absolutely do that, make that ask. Yeah, and if something is is in copyright, if you, um, if your institution owns the copyright, you could always put a Creative Commons license on it, and that. Every Creative Commons license, besides the um, CC0 in public domain, requires attribution. So you can always do that, go that route if you own the copyright. Um, but otherwise, yeah, if it's in the public domain, it's just you can request it. And most people are pretty happy to do it because if you tell them exactly, like, you know, please, uh, you know, credit us, blah, 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 blah. I think people like to do that because it makes them feel safer <laughs> when they're using your stuff. Um, okay, so I'm going to go to the next one is Donna Esposito. Uh, okay, you got to give me a second to read this one. <laughs> Look at photos. Uh, that sounds like that stuff is still in copyright <laughs> to me. I don't know, Jennifer, can you, can you read this one? Yeah. Um, you know, again, I don't, we don't want to give any, you any legal advice, so I'm not going to, you know, yeah. um, technically, well, I, I don't know. If you can find the heirs, it, it, it might be a nice courtesy to reach out to them um, and let them know you have it, let them know how you acquired it and, you know, say we'll credit your, uh, is it his children or whatever, you know, we'll credit your father, your grandfather, um, you know, we'll thank your family, you know, whatever you can do to kind of uh, make that work for you. Um, I, you know, I've, I've had, I just worked with a historical society, same, same situation. They bought a collection of photographs off of eBay. Um, and this shows you how, how crazy copyright lasts. They were taken by a woman when she was 13 um, in like the early 1920s. I think that's about right. She lived to be until 2005. So those are technically protected until 2075. Now she had no heirs, so they didn't really have anyone to go ask. Um, so they, they did decide to digitize it. Um, I don't know what they would have done if they could have found some heirs, but they did look. Um, so, you know, that's, I'm, I'm not gonna tell you what to do there, but, uh, you know, if you can make the case of how wonderful they are, this is a wonderful resource and people would really love to have access to it. I'm not looking to make any money. I'm just looking to share the information. I mean, I, I don't think it can hurt to try to reach out to them if you, if they're easily locatable and, and can be contacted. Um, and then I was looking at this question from Stacy about um, taking a photo of a novel. So I assume the novel is still in copyright. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't be an issue. Taking a photo of a novel. So a page of the novel um, or just the cover? The cover. And if the co I mean, I would say if the cover has like some amazing cool artwork or it's like a super famous book, we might be more careful, but if it's not a super creative cover and it's just the title, like that weighs more towards fair use, you know? Um, I mean, I kind of look at the four factors, but it seems, I, again, I can't give legal advice, but it's, cause the cover could be called the full cover, you know? Um, if you were taking a picture of one page inside the book, that's probably considered more like towards fair use because it's one page out of, let's say, you know, hundreds of pages or something. 
um, cover is a little bit different. So, I mean, if it's just like a boring cover with words on it, that's probably more weighing towards fair use. You know, you want to look at the other, you know, how downloadable is it and all that kind of stuff. I think you could probably make a case for it. Um, but again, it's kind of like to look at the four factors and kind of, you know, think about how you justify it and, and uh, I would say go from there. And make it small. Maybe talk to um, public librarians. I'm sure that they, if you're, I mean, if you're not one, you yeah. might be one. Um, but uh, I'm sure they deal with this all the time. They promote book book discussions, um, find oh, out yeah, what they're doing. Right, right, right. And Dina, right. I just, um, there is a, something in the ARL code um, about using uh, materials for publicity and like exhibition purposes, I think. So yeah, that is a good resource. <laughs> Any other questions from anyone? I hope it wasn't too heavy duty. I know this is kind of a thick topic <laughs> to talk about for over an hour. Okay. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks for spending the afternoon with us. Yeah, thanks everyone for, yeah, for, <laughs> Hanging in and listening to the whole thing.